Thank you for listening to the BJJ Brick Podcast. We'll be bringing you Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and good times. We hope to flatten your Jiu-Jitsu learning curve, help you get the most out of your grappling ability, and meet your goals both on and off the mat. Welcome back to the BJJ Brick Podcast. This is episode 323. Today we have a very special guest, Amal Easton. He's a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt. He's going to teach us a lot of stuff. He's going to drop some knowledge. And we are excited for the show. It's going to be a great one. Speaking of that, how are you doing today, Byron? Great. Doing good. But, uh, you know, the podcast is kind of a team. And that reminds me of a, of a quote by Greg Popovich, uh, you know, talking about how I'm doing. Even if I wasn't doing great, it would still be a good show because I know you guys got my back. Uh, literally. 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 And, and way too often. <laughs> but the quote by Greg Popovich it's not about any one person. You've got to get over yourself and realize that it takes a group to get this thing done. And he's talking about, he's a basketball coach of the Spurs, very famous for his coaching ability and uh, development of talent. Uh, if you haven't, if you don't know much about Greg Popovich, look him up and, and, uh, and learn about him. He's, as far as a coaching example, he's one of the best. And uh, the quote is, is, a, is a big deal. If, if, the, if a person was an st- amazing athlete, a great person on the field or on the court <laughs> or on the mat, but they had a bad attitude or they, had a, they were like a negative influence on the whole team, uh, he, would, he would not want that person on his team because the team is more important than any one person. Joe, what do you think about that? The, the great thing about Greg Popovich is, is for like, 30 plus years. I don't know. He's been, he's been a fixture in the NBA for as long as I can remember. And I was kind of a big fan back when I was a teenager, <laughs> which was a, a week or two ago. Um, decade or, yeah, many or decades three ago. Or, or three. <laughs> uh, but it's, he did such a great job of getting his players to buy into this. You know, he's been a coach for forever. And recently there was a little blow up with Kawhi Leonard on their team, but that's like the first, like ego issue, and I don't really know that it was all ego. I don't know what was going on with Kawhi, but uh, it's the first issue similar to that in over 30 years. You know, he had uh, David Robinson, who was arguably one of the best big men, and then followed up with uh, Tim Duncan, and those guys overlapped for a little bit, and that's not always easy to do. You know, they're basically playing the same role on the team. They're both superstars, and and David Robinson's kind of got to give up his superstar status a little bit early, and at the same time, Tim Duncan's got to delay his taking of the reins of the team, and that's a very difficult thing to do to get guys like that, those egos, all that success, and man, he did that flawlessly, and and so like as a BJJ coach, you can take this quote and and quote it to your team and say, oh, this is great, but man, what you really got to do is get your whole team to buy into it, and once they do... Uh, there was a period of time there where the Spurs for 15, 20 years were in the playoffs almost every year and won two or three championships a decade for like 20 years. And, and that's just unheard of. So that's a great quote. Pop is a Gary, great, I, uh, so great I, coach. So I follow basketball least of anybody in here. So I didn't know any of those things about the team. Gary, do you follow much basketball uh, at the NBA level? I know you're definitely a coach at, the, at, a, at a level below that. I don't know if it's really below that. I, I think my <laughs> players are just as good. Um, no, I'm actually kidding. But um, I, I I do follow the NBA. Uh, I'm more of a college basketball guy. But like Joe said, Pop is a, is a legend. Um, you know, he's uh, he does get his players to uh, play together. Uh, people really like playing for him. Um, like Joe said, the only person you've ever really seen that didn't want to play for him was Kawhi. And, and who knows really what happened there. But Joe made a good point about when David Robinson, the admiral, was playing with uh, Tim Duncan, and and Tim came in, and you know he had. It's hard when you have two superstars like that, and uh, he had no problem with that. Um, you know he he had that team playing, but it also not even just going about basketball, any sport, jujitsu. Uh, you know your work, your your work team. Um, you know your family life. But it made me also think about something I've been. I just was watching on the news. Uh, some guy just uh, broke the uh, uh, marathon record. He he did it in twenty he, seconds under, under yeah two hours. It was like one hour fifty. Yeah, one hour fifty nine minutes and forty seconds. And I saw them interviewing him, and he was talking about his pacers. You know, he's like, I would I would not have been able to do this without my pacers, and and that just made me think about this. It's not. You know, he's the guy who set the record, 
But when they talked to him about it, he did talk about he wouldn't have been able to do it without his pacers. So, you know, the guys running beside him, changing out every mile to keep him going <laughs> at that. I think it was like a four forty six mile pace, which which is incredible. Yeah, so so uh most of us don't ever run more than a few miles in a, in a, at a time, right? Maybe somebody runs a 10K. That's not uncommon for guys who train jiu-jitsu to run 5Ks and stuff. But uh, 26 miles, that's that's so many miles that most of us can't even really conceive of how what, what a feat it is to do this in under two hours. But that's 26 sub-five-minute miles in a row. So if you've ever ran a five-minute mile, most of us have not. Some of us probably come really close. But if you've ever run a really quick mile like that, imagine doing that 26 times in a row. <laughs> Without stopping. Without stopping. I mean, just five-minute mile <laughs> after five-minute mile after five-minute mile. That's incredible. You know, what do you guys – I mean, I know this is off topic, but what do you guys think you could run a mile in if you just warmed up and tried to do your fastest mile? Oh, 10 minutes, maybe nine if a bear was, maybe nine if a bear was chasing me. I mean, that's how crazy it is. Here to this guy, you know, I was thinking about the same thing, you know, maybe I could get eight, um, but I'd probably tear my hamstring a quarter mile into it. But, um, you know, he's, he's doing this 26 times, <laughs> he's doing this 26 times straight and basically halfing what Joe and I could do on our best. You know, our second one, we'd be at 11. Our third one, we'd be at 14. Yeah. The, you the, know, the and issue with this, and not that we're a, a running podcast, is yeah. that it gets exponentially harder when you add another mile. So there's there's a lot of people who could run a mile under five minutes. None of them are on the podcast today, unless I'm always one of them. But uh, th- there's a lot. There's thousands of people that could do this. Now, if you make it two miles, both under five minutes, that number is cut probably more than in half. I don't I don't know. Maybe, but somewhere it drops off into where. There's only one person can keep keep that pace up for 26, and the the further you go, it gets way harder. Because I could I can maybe run a lap around the track a quarter mile at that pace. I couldn't do it twice. I could I know I couldn't do it twice. I yeah I don't know if I could. Uh, yeah <laughs> yeah keep bragging. You know, <laughs> you, Joe and I were the old guys, and you got to throw that out there. We appreciate that. That's true. You know, Byron, it, it's was, not, was there, Byron, was the it's average not about any one team. person. You know, there's three of us. <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, you know the, fun, the funny thing is, and I'm sure this has a correlation to BJJ, is how sort of expectations change because uh, the the uh, the marathon time has been getting shorter and shorter. But it wasn't that long ago that I think most distance runners would think of sub minute, sub five minute miles as sort of sprinting. That they wouldn't. Yeah. Thirty years ago, they wouldn't even have thought that was in their wheelhouse. You know, but. Uh, I mean, the athletes just keep getting better and better, and, and expectations change. And there was a time uh, that, like, even in I think it was in the seventies, uh, early seventies, that women didn't run in the marathons. <laughs> like, you can't, they can't do it. It's too far. They're going to damage their bodies, or what, like, uh, maybe was, I don't know what the date is, but it wasn't that long ago that it just wasn't. And now they're out there running and doing great. Um, uh, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> expectations are a big deal. And I'm, I'm, and I would expect if it's anything like the the mile time, the sub four minute mile, that over the next ten years there'll be a lot of people that run this thing in under two hours, even though it's basically an impossible feat. Uh, it's not anymore. And then like once that wall broke for the sub minute mile, yep. sub four minute mile, that was a world record. We have high school kids in high school that could run that in yep. under four minutes. That's amazing. So once it's and, and part of it also is the advancements in training and science and training. And I think jiu has gotten a lot in that as well. Uh, there's a lot more to go, but how we teach jiu how we learn jiu how we make these things happen on the mats. And, and Amal Easton is, is definitely one of the people who teaches in, in an advanced way. I mean, if he was, if the, if the guy he is today was, you know, brought back into the past, he would have been, um, there'd be statues of him. Like, you know, like, like it's such an advantage the way we, are able to explain things because he gives some really great examples and vivid uh, imagery about how uh, you know teaching jujitsu and, and, and some of his ideas. But uh, <laughs> man, I'm excited for the interview. I, I do want to mention that we have a uh, uh, couple audiobooks for sale and in our uh, new store. There we go. And and I 
we we talked about this a couple a week ago maybe or two weeks ago that we should make a little store, and I thought about it. One of my biggest annoyances is when we go, we go to paste or we go to uh, post the the podcast episode, and the image that pops up is not the image of Omal Easton. It's the image of the audiobook or the image of the Patreon uh, l- uh, link or something like that. Like the, We have several images in the show notes, and I would like the interviewee to be front and center in, in social media or on the – like. but so, I don't, we don't pick that. And it's super annoying. Hey, check out the interview with Omal Easton. And then it has an audiobook as the, as the little clip art thing. I'm like, that's annoying. I don't know how to change that. So now Amal Easton's picture – will be the picture in the post. And and then there'll be a link for the audiobooks that are not images. And maybe we'll sell a few less, but it is it's we'll see. And, 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 or you, you just go to the Beach of Brick homepage and there's a thing called the shop. Click on that. It's got all our audiobooks there uh, ready to 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 uh, be listened to basically. But uh Six Games for BJJ is an audiobook I made and it's designed to help you introduce a playful style of altering your game while you're rolling. And, and you don't even need your teammates to be on board on this. It doesn't matter um, if, so let's just say you try to roll like Gary. You know, you're doing a lot of Kimuras, uh, some some sweeps, some some half guard, and uh, leg cramps are a big part of his game. <laughs> <laughs> That's my best offense is when Gary gets leg cramp. I, I, I hit the, 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 put the, the pedal on the floor. Uh, but so you model somebody and, and you uh, and you kind of emulate their game, and you'll learn some stuff about how your game matches with that, or how their game is uh, a benefit to you. And it, and and ultimately, it will help you learn how to defeat a guy like Gary's game because you'll see kind of the 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 details behind it. And uh, anyway, that's just one. There's six games you play them while you roll, and uh, it's it's a it's a new way if 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 you're kind of bored of the same old routine of of you know pull guard. Try to get a triangle and then get a leg cramp. Do, get a leg, do it again and repeat. And, or you're just kind of stuck in the same game. These games will definitely take you out of that. It's about an hour long, and uh, it's five ninety nine, and the money goes and helps support the show. So check it out. There's a link, not an image, in the uh, show notes. So uh, uh, check that out, please. <laughs> Man, Byron, you're a smart guy. No, I'm sure <laughs> we'll sell less books <laughs> because I took the images away. <laughs> no, no. Um, Man, I, I was going to use something you did recently as a life lesson. I've got it in my back pocket for when we need one. But i got to tell you, for the listeners, uh, Gary and I show up on the weekends and, and record. But, man, Byron puts in the work behind the scenes. And uh, this podcast is just it, – it's a great example of, you know, kind of dedication, determination, hard work, and just consistency. And, and, and good things just grow over time if you put that work into them. Yeah. And so life lesson, I kind of forgot about the life lesson. I was going to mention a, a quick one here. Uh, one of my favorite authors is Malcolm Gladwell, and he's a very popular author. If you, uh, New York Times bestselling author, he just writes, he writes in a way that's very interesting to read, and you always learn something from him. I've read all this stuff. Uh, it, it has been a while since I've had anything new, you know, in that style. I found uh, an author named Michael Lewis. Uh, which he wrote uh, the, the book The Blind Side, uh, which is a movie about, and, and I'm sure many people have seen the, the movie versus read the book, but his Great writing movie. style is very, it's artistic and, and, and you learn a lot. So the book, it's about football, but it's really about a, a person's struggle in their life and, 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 and also the, the changes that are made in the game of football uh, because of the, the person guarding the blind side and then the person attacking the blind side and, and how I know it's a little about football but uh, and how that's changed and how the, the, this position is, is now one of the higher paid people is, is on the defensive line protecting the quarterback and so I, I know it's a little about I don't watch football I don't you know I'm a <laughs> I'm a jiu-jitsu guy that's where that's the sport I find interesting but uh, it, it, it's you know, I'm not a football fan love the book and now I've got a whole new library of, of books and I'm reading The Undoing Project. It's by Michael Lewis as well. And he's, uh, he's I just love the style of that. And so, uh, I don't know, off the mat lesson or not, go check out this author. <laughs> and, uh, it, and and you'll, you'll enjoy his artistic writing style. But when I think about jiu-jitsu, we tend to learn most of our jiu-jitsu 
from one source. And so uh, I got most of my enjoyment of this writing style from Michael Gladwell, but then I found a new coach or I found a new uh, instructor or author. And, and not that I'm leaving Malcolm Gladwell at all, but I found something that I really enjoy. Uh, and, and we could do that when you take a seminar or you buy a DVD or something like that. You, you learn from a different approach and then you could really appreciate uh, a, new, a different side of jiu-jitsu. So that's a bit, is that a bit of a, too much of a stretch to, for off the mat to on the mat? But uh, I'm just excited. If I know a lot of listeners, uh, he's a very popular author like Malcolm Gladwell. Go check out Michael Lewis if you have finished off that library that he's he's completed. You know, Byron, I don't think that's too much of a stretch at all. Um, you know, like you said, uh, you know, you've learned most of your, you know, go back to jiu-jitsu, you've learned most of your stuff from one person. But, you know, you'll go out and you'll get a DVD, you'll go to a seminar, you'll go, uh, you know, you're traveling and, and you go learn from somebody else. And, uh, you know, it's the more people you train with, the, you know, the, the samurai, um, you know, who is uh, going to different places, the more people you train with, the more you're going to learn, the more your games can open up. So uh, not a stretch at all. Nice, Gary. I appreciate that. You, uh, you, you brought it back more into the mess than I had it. So well done. Joe, you were you were going to say something about the Blind Side? Oh, I was like, just to say, no, it, it was just a great movie, uh, and uh, the book's probably even better. It usually is. So, if your life lesson did nothing else this morning, hopefully, it encouraged somebody to go pick up a book this week and read. That's always a good thing. The, and I've only I seen the movie once, and it was quite a while ago. And it's got Sandra Bullock, and the book doesn't have that. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> well, um, well, I'm not reading it then. <laughs> but but the come book, on, Gary, use your imagination. <laughs> <laughs> the the book is interesting because it covers trends in football as well as the story of of this this the struggling young man who struggles with school who struggles with with a lot of different things in his life, uh, but he's got a few gifts that he's been given and, and how he is able to to use those and but uh, it covers Apart. like so we see trends in grappling we'll see like the leg lock trend and then uh, you know different trends or styles will come on uh, similar to that in different sport is is very interesting to me and and the book does cover that which I don't think that the the movie covers that at all. You know what? I, yeah, the movie does not cover that at all. But, you know, I like taking kind of like what you were saying about the book. You know, here's a guy who struggles with school, who struggle, you know, struggles with a place to live and, you know, just having a hard time. But it all goes back to our to our quote. It's not about any one person. And, you know, this family, you know, helped this guy out and he helped that family out, too. Um, and, uh, you know, they not one person. Everybody uh, just elevated each other to a different level. Yeah. yeah. And speaking of elevating other people to another level, we have Amal Easton. He is the most interesting grappler in the world. He went to prison for transporting a huge amount of jujitsu across the border, hidden in his gi. His grandkids could roll before they could crawl. He has never swatted a mosquito that was biting him. It's not that he doesn't want to. It's just too similar to tapping, and that's not in his nature. I don't always listen to podcasts, but when I do, I prefer the BJJ Brick podcast. Stay sweaty, my friends. All right, my friends, I'm happy to bring Amal East into the BJJ Brick podcast. Amal, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm glad to have you. You you have a lot going on. Um, I, I wrote down a couple of different, uh, just general topics. I have some questions, of course, but general topics. Uh, I'd like to talk a bit about your uh, athletic career in jujitsu, uh, as far as performance goes for yourself, and then uh, coaching and developing students is, is a big one. Um, uh, running a jujitsu school, which is I think is different than coaching. There's two different skills entirely. And uh, and then your stuff you have online as well. You started a podcast, and or you're involved in a in a podcast. I don't really know who started whatever, but <laughs> we'll get to that. Um, welcome to the show. And can you just bring us a little bit of uh, personal history about who you are, where you're at, and what you're up to? Um, I mean, I don't know where to start. I I, I was you know I'm from New Mexico. I just I got in uh, introduced to martial arts through uh, Muay Thai when I was super young. It was probably late seventies. Um, did Muay Thai for a while, kind of saw some snowy versions of Gracie in action, thought it looked pretty cool. I always liked uh, wrestling around. And so, uh, 
I, uh, there was a guy that moved to town in about in, around 1990. Uh, I was introduced to Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And then in 90, so I started Brazilian Jiu Jitsu in 95. I moved to Rio de Janeiro. I lived there for three and a half years, uh, training at Gracie Baja, which was kind of, uh, you know, one of the few best places in the world to train Jiu Jitsu. Um, trained there for almost four years and then moved back to the States. Uh, and started uh, my school here in Boulder, Colorado. And now we, uh, you know, we're kind of uh, all across the front range at this moment. Yeah. He, he, I mean, you, you had uh, athletes at ADCC, it, it, top jiu-jitsu school, and you got people competing in the UFC as well. So <laughs> uh, amazing uh, thing you have going on there. Um, you also, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, did a bit of skiing as a, as a, as a kid or as a, as a young adult. Is that true? You know, it's funny. I was looking at my uh, high school yearbook photos from my senior year in high school. I was 16 when I graduated from high school, um, and I was super small, kind of a late bloomer. Um, so I was I, I, not only was I the youngest person in my graduating class of 600 people, but I looked the part. Um, so to say that I didn't do well in team sports was an understatement. Um so I discovered skiing and I really excelled at it somehow. Just my, you know, balance and body awareness was good at that. So it was something that I was good at. So yeah, I was obsessed with skiing. I, if you'd have asked me back then, I couldn't imagine that there'd be a point in my life when I didn't ski every day. So what age was that versus when you started with, with Muay Thai or, or started with Jiu Jitsu? Where was the transition? Mm, I, so Muay Thai, I, I kind of had to do when I was young, just cause I was kind of small and I grew up in a, you know, white minority area. And there was a lot of just racial tension in, in New Mexico in general. So, uh, you know, my parents put me in martial arts as kind of a form of self-defense. I guess when I was about 20, I started really, you know, or maybe 17, I started focusing on it more. And when I was about 20, uh, I went to school for acupuncture and I started really focusing on, on martial arts kind of, uh, a lot more seriously. Did you find that having, I'm always interested in, in when, when somebody walks into the, uh, the gym for the first time, we all have backgrounds that are, that are behind this, whether we wrestled is the obvious one, or if you, if you did baseball or football or soccer, whatever. And, and these tend to kind of come into play a little bit. Uh, as an advantage, and if they are able to use it, were you able to use your skiing experience as an advantage uh, while learning martial arts? You know, I think that through skiing, I did a lot of hiking and a lot of physical activity. So I think I had strong legs. I and I was, you know, I was pretty good with just suffering. You know, like <laughs> like if somebody was holding me down in an awkward position or whatever it is, and just from growing up a small person, you know, and getting fucked with a lot, and however it was, like. Um, it made me good at sucking. And whenever I think anyone who starts jujitsu is has to embrace kind of that grind and kind of embrace, you know, not being great. Even if you're big, maybe you could be, you know, we're big and athletic and good at everything you did your whole life, but um, you're going to, you're going to get just tied in knots by some small geeky looking dude. Um, and so I think that, you know, growing up kind of a smaller kid, in like, you know, a little bit of a tense place. Um, I think it made me kind of be uh, kind of comfortable with adversity a little bit. Like I, you know, I pride myself you have to just take pride in what you've got. Right. But I pride myself in, in being good at being horrible. <laughs> if that that's, makes any sense. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's interesting. Usually I think of when I think of sports, uh, helping somebody, uh, you know, be better on the mats it's. I wouldn't have been surprised if you said, "Oh, I had a good balance or good reflexes, or uh, you know, something like that." Was I don't, I've never skied, so I don't even know what skills you'd pick up from that. But uh, it was it was more psychological, and 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 the person that you were was somebody who had a lot of grit, and and you got that through skiing. So that that's surprised me for sure, and and a very interesting one. I think that's it. I have a good friend who's always excelled at all the sports they've done, and crushed school went to an ivy league college um and and they have a very difficult time not being good at stuff 
And so that's an interesting, you know, when I look at their life or that upbringing, or it's, it's very foreign to me just thinking, wow, you just walk onto the varsity team. <laughs> you would, you know, crush the SATs, walk right into whatever college you wanted. And, and the flip side of that is 30 years later, however many years later, I look and I'm like, mm, and they realize it too. Like they have a difficult time when they, when they're not good at stuff. Yeah. And, and so that's just, you know, it's a different kind of skill. Hopefully we can all embrace whatever skills we have, but I realize that my special power is sucking. <laughs> <laughs> a very humble, uh, <laughs> uh, thing there. But another thing with those people and it, it, I don't think a lot of times even realize it when you pick up something super easy, when you walk on the mat, you have no experience and everything is just coming easy to you. And that's a rare case, but there are those people who just learn jujitsu at a fast rate. A lot of times yeah. it's harder for them to teach jujitsu because they don't understand the student's perspective of, of why it's not working or what they're doing wrong. Of course, you know, do the arm bar and then triangle that and then, you know, we'll plot it from there. It's super easy. No, it's not super easy. That's really hard. And, and I'm having a hard time as a new person or as somebody uh, that's trying to learn this from you. So I think sometimes the, the, the students who struggled and had to learn the process of learning are far better teachers. That's true. So I always had good body awareness. Like I said, when I went skiing, I, the, I crushed the varsity team at skiing. You know, like right away, I had just somehow good kinesthetic awareness. Um, but I was small in stature. I was so I've always picked up jujitsu moves and such. Not like you know, on a one to ten, I'm probably like a six, you know, or a seven. You know, they say like BJ Penn got his black belt in three and a half years, or you know, that wasn't me. But definitely, it gives you more of a uh, sensitivity or more of an awareness of how it is for people to learn when you struggle a little bit, you know, like, I think it's difficult for people that everything's came easy for them sometimes to teach because it's hard to understand the guy with two left feet. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't mean to keep digging on this, but I have never trained with PGA Penn. I think it'd be an amazing opportunity, but who would you, I don't know the answer to this, but you might get more from training with BJ Penn for an afternoon or training with BJ Penn's coach who got him to the black belt in, in that time frame. I don't know what the right answer is, but uh, it, sometimes it's very frustrating being around someone who's so gifted at, at uh, picking something up. I think they're both valuable studies and valuable lessons. Yeah. You know, uh, like, like I've had the opportunity to train with a lot of the jujitsu greats throughout my life, you know, and there's been times like there was a day when I trained with Braulio Estima and I've trained with Braulio a lot. I've known him since Purple Belt. He's been out here at our school a bunch. Like we've been good friends for a long time. Uh, there was a day when he put a, you know, uh, me as a black belt, but he put a beating on me that just made me want to, you know, cry and feel like a white belt. And I learned a lot that day. And I think I grew a lot that day. So, you know, it goes both ways at the same time, you know, like, uh, you can learn a lot, like, uh, the head coach from GFT is this guy, Julio Caesar, amazing coach. And, uh, you know, he, he I, I don't, it's not like training with his best student, Rodolfo Vieira, you know, those are two very different experiences, <laughs> but I think they both have a lot to offer. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that diversity of training is important for all of us. Uh, so you, you moved to Brazil in 95. What, how much experience training did you have before you made that? That seems like a big leap. Were you were you pretty new at jiu-jitsu, or had you committed your life already to it before that? So I was obsessed with jiu-jitsu. I'd had about, I started probably in 90, yeah, around maybe 92, 91, something like that. I was a solid white belt. Like, I got my blue belt within about two or three months of being in Brazil. Like, I felt great against any white belt. You know, we had a purple belt, Marco Gonzalez, or a blue belt, and then turned purple, who moved to New Mexico. That was how we really got introduced to Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Um, he was a student under the Machados, and there was classes three days a week. It, of course, it was all beginners. There was no YouTube. There was no – your only uh, information for jiu-jitsu was through your teacher, period. There was nothing else. There wasn't even another school. There wasn't other – there was nothing. So – uh I would do the classes and then I set up my garage with mats and I would have, you know, a couple of the kind of students that were really into it. We would train every single day once or twice and just do what we did. 
But at that time, like he would teach you a triangle and then he'd say, okay, now you can't teach anybody this triangle. Like this is yours. You paid for it. You own it, but you're not allowed to teach it. You can do it to people. But if I find out you're telling people how to do it, I'm going to be upset. So that was a different mentality, you know, but um, we got really good at the, you know, the few things that we were taught. And uh, so when I got to Brazil, I, you know, I, I, I won my first tournament at white belt. Um, and got my blue belt. So that was pretty exciting within a couple months of being there. And that was 95. Yeah. That, that, that's funny. The don't tell anybody, <laughs> this is your technique. You paid for it. Uh, that's just so foreign to the way people train now. I mean, if you tapped me with anything, uh, it wouldn't be unusual for me to say, what was that? And it would, and I can't imagine anybody saying, okay, here's what, here's what happened. You know, like that's just the way jujitsu is now. It's 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 changed uh, ultimately to to accelerate everyone's growth and the development of the sport. It's a different it's a different world. You can't have secrets like that anymore. Like you could go to YouTube and find twenty variations of whatever I did. Yeah, you know? that, yeah. So, I mean, back then, but but you know, back then, you know, some the biggest teams in Brazil when I was there was Gracie Baja, Carlson Gracie, and Novo Niao. And for example, like. One of our guys invented a sweep. It was the star sweep, you know, where you do back roll and you stand up with their leg. Okay. Some variations of that. And that was like, we were the ones that did that. And we would have guys crush the tournaments and a large percentage of our points would be with that sweep because nobody had ever really seen it or done it. Yeah. And, and that's the only people that, the only people that got to do it or figure it out, you had to be present at the tournament and see it happen because nobody was going to show you. Like if you were from yeah. a different academy, maybe you see the guys make the points, but if you weren't paying attention, you miss it. So you could make your career off of a couple of moves. So that was an interesting thing. Now, I mean, how many moves? Yeah, you know, you could say, well, the Meow Brothers win all the tournaments with Baron Bolo, but they've got a thousand other moves that go with that, you know, a million variations. Or, you know, it's an exaggeration, obviously. But back in the day, you could make a career off of a couple of moves because if you weren't there to see it live, that was it. You didn't. You couldn't. You couldn't solve a problem that you'd never seen before. Uh, you couldn't learn it. Imagine, yeah. like with boxing, for example, back in the day there were people that could make their career off two or three moves. So, you know, how they fade and throw a right cross or how they fade and bring you in and then throw their hook. And if you didn't see it live, there wasn't video. You couldn't study it. So you might have heard like folklore or rumor about how they do it. But if you're training to fight that guy, you're not quite sure until you step in the ring because you've never seen it. You can't, you know, with jujitsu, the same thing. You're like, well, it was kind of this half guard thing. that was like, you know, like a very different era. Information age is a trip. Yeah, it's wild to think about. <laughs> and you also have to filter through that. But uh, I think that it's—I don't know. I worry. You know, you, I don't know if you type in arm bar on YouTube if you find you know thousand or a million things. But uh, typically, the better ones end up at, towards the top. And and if you can recognize somebody's face who's teaching it to you, and they're a lot of times uh, great instructors, uh, you know, that's that's a little easier to. I don't know, but if you if you go to the fiftieth page and learn on bar, you might end up with something that looks totally different than what you would expect. And uh, <laughs> yeah, sometimes over inf information overload is is a can slow us down, but overall, I think it's a great thing. Um, I mean, imagine, um, I mean, the the greatest example of this, and it's the same thing, is is politics. Like, I don't know what your political bias is, and I don't know, you know, you don't know what mine is. It doesn't matter. But no matter how extreme they are, we could Google on YouTube and find lots of information that backs up whatever we think. Yeah, and, and, and so, uh, yeah, you have to be discerning. There's a lot of noise, and a lot of times it'll show you, show you what you want to think, even if you. We all have our own biases. So if you're Googling something, Google is already know, knows who, you, you know, your preferences. They've already figured that out. You. So they're, they're, yep. they're feeding you what you already want, unless you really, it is yeah. crazy time. <laughs> um, so, so you started off pr pretty intense with jujitsu, uh, and then you moved to Brazil. Uh, how was the, the rest? Did you compete the entire time of, of your training and coming up through the ranks? Yes, I did. I was obsessed with it. I I'd fought, you know, I'd fought a couple of Thai boxing matches and even the ones that I'd won were brutal. <laughs> you know, like I got beat up. So one of the things that I was really excited about with jujitsu and still am is that you can go hard, excuse me, and not get hurt. 
So I was so excited. Like the tournament that I went to, the first one that I, I earned my blue belt after the tournament, I yeah. won as a white belt. I had six matches. I submitted five out of six of them. Nobody got hurt, myself or them. And that was cool because that doesn't happen with Thai boxing or striking. And so I think it's something that we're always very aware of. And I think that people maybe who haven't experienced other martial arts don't, they kind of forget how effective, like that's one of the reasons that Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is so effective because you can go pretty hard and have more of a realistic feeling without getting hurt. So you can still get that, you know, if you've not competed, you go to a tournament or if you have, you get that adrenaline dump, you know, and you, different people channel it different ways. For some people, it totally shuts them down, but you get to experience that in a, in a, in a, you know, real safe environment. So that's one of the cool things about it. So I was obsessed with that and uh, I did every tournament I could that all of us did. It was an interesting time. You know, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu was uh, not popular in Brazil, like to the point where um, people hate, you know, they saw Jiu Jitsu guys as thugs. So if you had say go out at night and meet a girl at a club, I wouldn't tell her I did jujitsu because she would think I was like, you know, some kind of thug. It didn't become real popular until it became popular in America. What was that? Uh, were they mischaracterizing jujitsu people or was there a thuggish element to, to the way people were behaving? Yes and no, <laughs> you know, I mean, look, history doesn't change without something radical to shake it up. You know, like it takes, it takes some different kind of stuff. The Gracie family really put, you know, put it on the line with their sweat and blood to, to let the world know about Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And if they hadn't have done that, we might still be studying Taekwondo, you know, and in the process, like there were some guys that were ready to stand up and fight whoever to prove the effectiveness of the art, which today we owe our, you know, lives to, or me anyway, you know, I owe my well being. you know, my, I earn my money. I pay my rent. I feed my kids off of jujitsu. And it's kind of on the backs of those guys that really put it out there and suffered and proved the art because if it hadn't been for them, they might still just be a small family in Brazil, you know, who were amazing and nobody knew about them. Yeah. So there, there was some, you know, there was, it was crazy times. You'd go out to a club and there'd be, they called them pit boys. And they would, I mean, the guys looked like, you know, a balloon that's overfilled. And if you just flick it, it pops. <laughs> they looked like that. Like there was a great club, tons of, you know, beautiful people around. Everybody's having a good time. And then there's this guy standing there. That wasn't, this was not the Gracie family, by the way. But there's this guy standing there. We've all seen him. And they're just looking for a fight. Crazy. And in Brazil, like, they'd be totally, they would look anyway, totally steroided up, just jacked out of their gourds. They'd look like they were dressed more for a fight than a party. And you'd just be like, holy shit. Like I grew up in that kind of environment where it was like, it was easy to avoid it. Don't make eye contact, you know? But, uh, but you know, if High and Gracie was there at that party, those two were going to fight. <laughs> wow. and, and that's, that's part of, you know, like, I'm not saying it was right or wrong, but that's part of what, you know, proved the art. That's part of how our art was forged, you know? Yeah. It, and, and it uh, has definitely changed. <laughs> I'd imagine if, if you yeah, had thank a, God. Thank God. You it, go it, to Brazil it, now and it's cool. People think it's cool to do jujitsu. Good. Back in the day, it was not that way. Yeah, but, thank God. I'm, I'm way more my style, but but I still owe a great deal of gratitude to the people that you know, that forged that way. I mean, yeah. when you look at, when you talk about Helio Gracie and the guys he got in the cage with, you know, like Zulu was not somebody that people wanted to fight when Hickson fought Zulu. Uh, you know, all those guys, it was, that was intense. Helio was a small guy. Hickson wasn't that big. Hoist in the first UFC, that stuff was, it's amazing what those guys did. And they, you know, I mean, they had superpowers, but that, uh, you know, like I talked to my friend Hollis Gracie and he fought Bob Sapp. Wow. Yeah, I remember Bob that. Sapp, right? Yeah, I remember that. Fight. And so it's easy to be like, ah, Bob Sapp like falls down, or you know, what I mean, he takes fake fights, or you know, whatever. He's not that tough. He's a 350 pound human being that used to play pro football. The guy's a beast. Not many, you know. He knocked out, or he knocked out uh, Hoost, one of the greatest kickboxers to ever live. Like that's a that's an intense thing to step in the ring with a guy like that, regardless of his skills. So those guys really forged the way for the rest of us to, you know, have what we have today. 
Yeah. A, a little while ago, Amal, you were talking about your, your first tournament, and you said you had uh, six matches, I think, and, and five of them had a submission. Do you remember, um, just out of curiosity, were they all the same submission, or was it a variety of, of things that you were landing? No, a variety. Like, you know, I mean, it was good at arm bars, triangles, okay. bottas, you know, all, all, the, all the basic fundamentals, you know. You'd get booed if you did a straight ankle lock. <laughs> Anything near the foot, literally, you would get booed. It was pass the guard, mount, arm bar, you know, take the back, bow and arrow choke. I was, uh, I was very good. I, I wasn't great at wrestling or judo, and so I pulled the guard a lot. I liked to be on top, but I would end up on bottom a lot. I was also a small guy, and uh, I, was, I had a great arm bar from the guard, and then from there went, you know, triangle, omoplata, you know, the fundamentals. Yeah. Uh, is when did you uh, move back to the US? In 98. The end of 98 I moved back to the states. I thought I was going to move to Denver. I ended up coming to Boulder. It just felt like home. Um there was all, starting to be some jiu-jitsu on the coast, like Florida, California. You know, Henzo Gracie was in New York, but there was very few people out here. But I could see all the Brazilians were moving to the coast and there was no jiu-jitsu in the center of the country. And so I grew up in the mountains. As we spoke about, I was very comfortable with skiing, mountain biking, all the mountain sports. So I was very comfortable in the mountains. Um, and so I wanted to live somewhere where I could do all the stuff that I grew up doing. <clears throat> so I chose kind of Colorado and it's been great. We covered your early competition career. Tell us about something uh, in the black belt um, range. Man, my first tournament as a black belt i got my black belt in 2002 and my first tournament i got to represent america in the american nationals so it was you know and i was one of the few americans in that tournament and i fought a guy who actually he's an american but his nickname it was my first fight at black belt and nobody knew anything about him i think his last name was higgs and uh he was uh known for his nickname was triangle <laughs> so that was all I knew about him. And so I went out there and uh there I'm like, okay, we'll probably watch out for his triangle, you know? And uh he within fifteen seconds had me in a triangle. Oh man. And I sat there like, I don't believe this. Like, are you freaking kidding me? And I'm like trying to get out of it, you know, working my way out. I wasn't like in you know, I was in pretty deep, but you know, still able to fight it. And uh I it was funny because I looked out I was having a hard time getting out of it. And I looked up at one of my uh, coaches from Brazil, Chinguinha and Chinguinha kind of like talked me through it. You know, he gave me some clues or, you know, helped me out. I had, you know, obviously I was a black belt. I had experience, but it was, uh, I'll never forget him on the side, like do this, you know? And I was like, okay, that makes sense. You know? And then I got out of the triangle and um, it went good for me. It went well for me after that. Then I, then he kind of fell apart. Or I won't say that, but I, my game, I imposed my game upon him after that. And, uh, let's see, I think I ended up getting him with an arm bar or choke. I could be mistaken, but I won significantly after that, but I'll never forget that. Cause there you are. It's a weird feeling to tie that black belt around your waist, especially, you know, I was spending six to eight hours a day on the mat every day, you know, every day, six days a week, we'd take Sunday off, you know, most of the time, but, uh, every single day, just training. That's all I was doing for years. And uh, then I have my black belt, and there you are, all of a sudden competing at black belt level, and that's a trip. Not not to mention that guys like, you know, I fought Fabio Gurgel, and Fabio Gurgel was there for the first world championships. I barely got my blue belt, and I watched him win the, you know, worlds at black belt. And so there wasn't much of a master's category then, but basically the legends that you're looking up to as you're coming up through the ranks, they're waiting for you at black belt. And so that's a trip. Yeah. And, and we've, I think we've all experienced that when you have, like, I could put myself in the, the shoes of the guy who's got the, they call him triangle. And like, you have a couple of good techniques that, that you're confident in. And then you put that person in that technique and then it fails. It doesn't work out. <laughs> it's yeah, like, that's, the, yeah. So that's what sounds like happens. Like, my, I got him. This is game over. He's in a triangle, game over. And then when, uh-huh. when you get out, it's like, well, I got nothing now. Cause if he got out of my best thing, like a <laughs> kind of a, a mental yes hurdle no. that is yes hard to get no. over. Yes and no. Nobody gets the black belt just being a one trick. That's you know, true for the most part, but for sure it can be disheartening when if when you have like a game plan and this is how it's going to go and then it gets outside of that game plan, 
Yeah. You know? But I, 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 I took pride in having good jujitsu. Yeah. Like I said, back in the day, if you didn't come from one of those academies, we would go to Brazil and I mean, we'd go to like other cities in Brazil, like Minas Gerais or, or Sao Paulo and just destroy people. And it was like we had a secret weapon because there wasn't internet. Like if you hadn't learned it at our academy or somebody who was there, you didn't know it. You know, if you weren't from one of the big, when I came back to the States, I did every tournament I could and I would compete in every weight category. I was about 175 pounds, but I would do, they'd let you do all the weight categories. So sometimes I compete in five categories and I'd be out there (laughs) competing against guys that were 250. And some of them, you know, we're close to the Olympic training center. So we'd be competing against Olympic judo players, Olympic wrestlers, and guys were tough as hell. They didn't know jujitsu. <laughs> so you would, you'd walk in there like, Oh, I have, you know, I, I do, I have a superpower and you'd go in there and crush it. And that was, uh, that was amazing. It was an amazing feeling. It was amazing times. And, uh, you know, all those treasure having, you know, had the opportunity to, to have that experience. So b- besides having the internet and basically an abundance of information available to all students, uh, how has, like you, you as a coach or you as an instructor, how has the, the science of teaching jujitsu to somebody changed? Are, are, are you teaching the same style of, of, uh, of a class that you, that you were involved in when you started or has it changed quite a bit? Look, it's interesting. Back in the day, people didn't have curriculums. Very few people like the curriculum that I started with was passed down to one of my teachers, uh, Helio Seneca through, uh, Jean-Jacques Machado, you know, and then like Helio Gracie had a certain curriculum that he taught. There were like a few curriculums. Most people did what I call the two-step plan, which is show up and teach. And that was it. Like that's part of what we're trying to help people out with our Eastern online is help academies kind of get organized and figure out you know, how we can teach better, how we can share our art with more students, you know, and in the process of that, it's going to benefit us and them. But, um, so, you know, it was kind of like, oh, here's a random technique that I decided I'd work on this morning. Like a good example for me was that one of my top students, uh, one day we had kind of a tough wrestler come in and my guy was a good blue belt, should be able to handle any wrestler back in the day because they didn't know jujitsu. And the guy got him in a headlock and my student tapped and I was so upset. But at the end of the day, it was my fault because I hadn't. Hold on. Okay. Are you there? Yeah, I can hear you. At the end of the day, it was my fault because we hadn't worked escape headlock because I'd had a sore neck for a while. You know, and so my neck was sore, so I didn't want to deal with escape headlock. So then he got tapped out from, from headlock, but it was my fault because I hadn't taught escape headlock. So if you have a curriculum, you know that you get all the bases covered. So that wasn't going on back then. Now people have curriculums, you get a good solid fundamentals, and then you work on different, you know, then you can specialize or work on maybe whatever it is that suits your specific body type or, or personality from you there. Do, do you divide up your classes? You have like a beginning class and then intermediate, advanced, or competition? Like how do you... Uh, deal with different uh, skill levels on the mats? You know, one of the hardest things to have in an academy, in my opinion, is to be able to have a comfortable place for beginners who might not be super aggressive, you know, because I believe Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu can help, can help everybody, you know, not like it's designed for like the guy who doesn't have confidence, in my opinion, you know, not what I like to call a tough dishwasher who has no fighting experience, but like, man, he's a good fighter. You know, like he's really good at washing dishes, but he'll fuck you up because he's just a tough guy. So um, what the hardest part is to have a good environment for everybody. So that guy doesn't just beat up everybody. And so that, you know, my dad could come in and train and have a good experience and not get hurt. So that's the most challenging thing in an academy is to create a space for all those people. You know, where you have the tough dishwasher isn't just eating your lambs. You know, like, but he's helping them grow and also to have an environment where you can have people kind of go to war who want to take it, you know, kind of to the next level and are more competitive individuals. And how do you create that environment? We have three different, I mean, it's difficult at first. Most of it's through your culture and your school. You have to create the culture that everybody takes care of themselves. You know, the analogy that, that I like to use is the farm or the jungle, you know, like on the, 
on the farm, you try to make sure that all of your animals grow and they're all healthy and they all, you know, have a good life. In the jungle, the strong survive. You might have 20 kids and, you know, the, the weak ones are going to die and the strong ones are going to, you know, survive. And then those are the ones that, you know, with evolution are going to procreate and go create the most strongest, however it is. But on the farm, you're trying to raise everything so it survives and does well. So trying to create uh, a culture and an environment where your toughest guys aren't just coming there just for themselves and messing everybody up, but they're coming to the academy. And if they roll with, you know, my dad, they're going to take care of him, maybe help him learn some stuff. And, you know, that's the biggest, the biggest thing, which I think people have a very difficult time with. You know, like there's a lot of, there's, there's like garages where people train, you know, you have three tough dishwashers that are beating the hell out of each other. And anybody that comes in there gets proven how weak they are and gets, you know, beat up badly and never comes back. And there's a lot of that. That's like an extreme example, but there's a lot of jujitsu schools that uh, don't get that yet. Yeah. So, uh, one of my experiences that I've had, uh, as a black belt, I like to roll as I don't get to train every day. I get maybe train three to four times a week. But uh, yeah. when I go in and I train, if we're training four or six rounds, I'm training all of those rounds I can. I'm getting, and I get a variety of students of skill level. But one thing I realized if I sit out around, I could, I see things I would never see. Uh, like I might have a, a good brown belt that gives me a real fun roll every time. But then I'll watch the same person just annihilate a white belt. I'm like, okay, that's not what he does. Like, that's not right. But just right. by by sitting out occasionally or having somebody uh, watch the room, I think is a good way to uh, influence the culture. And and if if that's happening, that poor white belt's getting annihilated by somebody. You could you could either coach them out of that or coach the person off to let them work a little bit without the white belt having to ask, "Hey, can can I do some jujitsu here, or am I just going to be a dummy the entire time?" I mean, a little bit. At the end of the day, look, nobody wants to put a bunch of time into something that they suck at. Yeah, right. And at a certain point, you know, maybe maybe there's some of us that will never be spectacular at anything, but we don't want to like put our you know hard years of our life into something that we're horrible at. Like, so you come in and you just get beat up badly. It doesn't increase your confidence. And then maybe you quit jujitsu and decide to play the ukulele, you know, like, and so then us as a school or me of a teacher, I have failed that individual. Um, so it's, it's difficult, you know, cause it's not just watch like, you know, that, that, that brown belt might have a certain rapport with you that he doesn't have with the other guy. Yeah, And to create the mentality and the feeling of like a team within your school, they're like, look, we need to help bring everybody up. And like you, if you're going and competing at a high level, you need guys that are going to give you hell and you need guys that you can go to war with. And that's very important, you know, and, you know, my dad who comes in here kind of old, out of shape and is just trying to learn the fundamentals and get more confidence. He doesn't need to get the shit kicked out of him. You know, so everybody kind of like needs what they want. So, you know, if you're, if you're getting ready for a high level competition, you might not want to train with that guy a whole bunch, but sometimes you got to pay your dues and just help out the community. And then you have to understand who it is that you get to go hard with. It's not just because they're a higher belt. You might have a white belt that likes to go to war and can have that. That guy's the hardest one to understand. He's got to go light on other people too, because in the beginning, you're not great at, you know, you might not be great at jujitsu, like in a, smooth way but you might be a tough guy so yeah. you might roll with you know let's say you're rolling with a you know a very you know a, a 98 pound brown belt you know you might be able to throw that person on the roof but that's not what we're doing you could learn a lot from that person you're not proving anything they might have a lot more technique than you they might not be able to handle your size and strength you know so it's it's tough you know the flip side is I remember specifically a friend of mine in Brazil. He was very good at jujitsu, and he was like 33 years old, and he quit. Started the same time as I did. Quit jujitsu, and then I said, "Why?" And he said, "I keep getting hurt." And I said, "Well, it's because you go so hard because you feel like you have to win every match that you're killing yourself." And slowly but surely. The 21, 22 year olds are coming up. They've never been hurt in their life. They have no idea what that's even like. They go 200% every role and you feel like you have to beat them every time. You don't have a culture where people are taking care of you. He said to me, Hey, I, I, he quit jujitsu. He said, cause I keep getting hurt. 
And I said, well, man, go lighter. And he said, I don't like going lighter. Like, I just <laughs> like to go hard. With that mentality, you're going to have a short career. Yeah. And you're going to end other people's careers in the way, you know? And that's not what I'm – like, that's the kind of thing that we, we kind of have to coach people if we want to have a successful academy. You know, now, look, our pro team is, is similar, but, you know, if you want to be a pro fighter – you're going to have to, you're going to have to go to war a little more, you know? Um, you know, you don't want, you don't want to be like the, the worst guy in that room. Yeah. <laughs> like that's, you're getting beat up. That's a little bit different, you know, but for the Academy in general, that's not, you know, that's not what, that's not what we're doing. The, yeah. the, the, in today's day and age, I believe there are not, I believe there are some competitive academies out there where kind of people go like, man, if they go just for that, because there's a high percentage of just beasts in that room and that's what you're going for. But if you want to have a big school, you know, that, that with the objective of helping normal people, you can't have that. You can't put them in that environment. They're not ready for it. It won't behoove them. Yeah. They're, they're two different things, uh, but by, by quite a bit and, and, the, and the school could change, but if you're creating, if your goal of the school is to have, uh, you know, top tier athletes, and that's the goal, then you may not even care about the the new people coming in. But you know, if your goal is to to do that or to also uh, help the community or help people find a healthy activity that they could grow old with and and maintain fitness and and have a fun place to go. As for me, I go to jitsu instantly. 30 of my friends are in the same room hanging out and we're having a good time and we just happen to exercise as part of the process. Like we exercise pretty hard, but I'm not getting injured and uh, it's just an enjoyable process for me. Well, and man, I need you to be healthy because you said you're a firefighter. I need you to be able to put out the fire. <laughs> you know, like, and so do you to put food on the table. You need to leave there with all of your limbs intact. Yeah. You know? That's yeah. important. If like I, it, profession, high level professional boxers, they'll hire They'll pay basically mercenaries to come in to train with them. And they'll, they might even say, hey, guess what? If you can knock out my fighter, $5,000, right? And you're like, hell yeah, five grand. That's more money than I've earned in the last decade. Yeah. And guess wow. what that fighter's doing to you? He's, he's, he's destroying you. You're not going to knock him out. And he's going to knock you out. And yeah. you're going to get your $500 for coming and helping with his camp <laughs> and send you on your way. Because they don't care about that guy. With your brain that's damage. That's not what we're doing. Yeah, that's not what we're doing. We're taking care of people. Like we had it the other day. One of my coaches said, they just kind of, you know, it's easy to say. They said, you know, we've all, it was kind of a speech after class. And they said, we've all came, you know, and we choose to participate in this, what, what, in this danger, you know, it's a dangerous hobby. And I said, this is not a dangerous hobby. Frankly, this is the safest hobby I do. I ski, I mountain bike, do lots of stuff where people die. I haven't seen people die on the mat. Like for the most part, people don't get, when you, when you get hurt, somebody made a mistake. Either I went too hard, you didn't tap early enough. That shouldn't happen. I, I don't come, ever come into the academy and think I'm going to get hurt today. Right. Yeah. And the first time, the one thing I say about everybody over 30 is that they've been hurt before and they don't want to get hurt again. Sometimes when you're under 30, you've never had a surgery. You think you can do anything and you'll never get hurt. That's why so many young men die between the age of 18 and 25 because they think it won't happen to them because they think they're invincible. Right. But you can't have that going on in your school. Like the first time I go in and I'm like, man, I hope I don't get messed up today and you're going to lose that student. And not only that, but you're not, like I said, when I say you're going to lose that student, I could care less about the tuition. What I'm talking about is that my job as a teacher is to help them grow from jujitsu, which is my product, right? So I want them to grow from that. And, you know, so I, I, I'm not doing my job if, if, you, if you stop training. And that's, you've said a lot about it with, with the culture, with the individuals, with the different mindsets. For me, I stopped getting injured uh, when I took ownership of my own safety on the mats and also the safety of the person I'm training with. I uh, can't remember the last time I injured somebody significantly, you know, bumps and bruises, whatever. But when I said, if if I get hurt, it's I'm always going to blame myself, I stopped getting injured mm -hmm. because, you know, you're rolling with that guy who's a little crazy. 
you know what? If I can't, if I, I'm going to talk to him, hey, let's, let's slow it down. I, can't, I don't want to get injured. I got to be safe. And if that doesn't happen, mm-hmm. I'm not going to train with that guy anymore. <laughs> like, that's pretty easy. Yeah, 100%. And so ideally, you want everybody thinking like that. Like, I need to make sure I take care of myself and I need to make sure I take care of my partner. And there's always going to be people that have varying levels of that. There's going to be people that don't get it and they should be referred to your least favorite academy. <laughs> but, um, you know what I mean? There's always, there's people you're just like, this guy just doesn't get it. And, and I can't help everybody. I think he needs a psychiatrist, not a jujitsu school. Those are few and far between, but they, they happen. You could have one guy like that in your school and just ruin the whole experience for everybody. But for the most part, the more you can get everybody on that page, that's your culture. You know, that and then just having everybody just be supportive of each other in, you know, in a broader sense. And then you create a really cool community and, you know, a great, a great thing to be part of. Like, I'd like to think that my school creates community from kids, their parents, the older people in the community. Like, I don't want to be just hanging out with tough 25 year olds the rest of my life. I appreciate having kind of that jujitsu connection with everybody. Yeah. You mentioned a couple of times that your dad's on the mat training. How long has he been training? <laughs> the funny, my dad's dead. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> I just, my dad just, I wouldn't want to hurt his feelings. Like, what do you mean? I'm not a tough guy. <laughs> so yeah, no, my dad's dead. Okay. He never so, okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> but I got, if he was alive. I'd like him to be training. Yeah. I, uh, <laughs> man, I, uh, Put my foot in my mouth on that but one. I apologize. People, of, I'm all... <laughs> no, don't you? Lots of people's dads are in here training. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I, I, uh, like I brought my dad. We've got. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I, I brought my dad in. Uh, we had a, a Father's Day thing on Father's Day. You mm-hmm. know, bring in, bring in the old guys and, uh, Taught a little class and, and some simple things that were, that were very safe. And it was, it was kind of fun getting to know, uh, my dad in that respect and also, kind of seeing some of my teammates with their parents or their dad. It's like, I, I've never seen this person before and, and they look a lot alike or whatever. But one thing I noticed, like as a thing about all these old, older guys, guys in their mid sixties or early seventies, they still had strong hands. It was really pretty imp- Like mm-hmm. that's the old man's strength. I think is in the hands. Yeah. But yeah you, a lot you, of it, just a lot of life experience, which I personally, you know, appreciate being exposed to. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that's a good, I, I guess it's a good, uh, barometer to say, you know, would this be a place I would want a family member to train like that type of a safe thing? Um, and regardless of the goals that family member, if it's, if it's to, to come hang out and, and train, or if it's somebody who's wanting to, you know, get into the UFC or compete jujitsu at a high level, um, would the, is this that place? You nailed it right there. And honestly, that's exactly how I put it. I, here, here's one of the ways I think about it in life. Like if you're learning to swim, you have two different kinds of things. You have a swim coach and you have a lifeguard. The swim coach's job is to introduce you to water at first. Like if you're uncomfortable, you get your feet wet, splashes water on you, water. This is student, student, this is water. Slowly gets you comfortable until you're standing waist deep. You practice holding your breath, putting your head in the water. And when he says, okay, you're ready to float, you know, we're going to try to go in this deeper water. You trust him because he's brought you along slowly and you'll follow his lead. And when he says, do this, you're like, okay, he's not going to put me out of my comfort range. He's going to keep me safe and he's going to teach me how to swim. The flip side is a lifeguard. A lifeguard stands on the edge of the pool with a floaty and gets ready to jump in when you're almost drowning and drag you out before you die. When we're in an open mat or a rondori, we're sitting there doing one of the two. We're either the coach where we trust that everybody's good on the mat or we're a lifeguard where you're like, is the first second I have to be like, Hey, Andrew, go light on that guy. Hey, you know what I mean? Like yeah. I want my dad to be, I want my dad to be able to train with anybody on the mat even when I'm not watching and I'm not worried that they're going to, you know, act inappropriately or injure my father. Like I said, my father's dead. So I keep saying that, but, um, but that's the objective and, yeah. you know, and it's, you're never there. But what I would like is for, is for me not to even have to watch the run door that they're watching out for each other. So they're not like running over other people that they're taking care of their partner. And then I can train. 
on, you know, what you see a lot. And when you know that you're not doing it right is when you're like, yeah, there's no way that I can train while that guy's on the mat. I have to sit there and watch him and be like, Hey, don't go easy there. And it happens. That's just, that's the life of running a school. But your ideal is to not have to do that. So how do you deal with that student who is a, uh, a, a bit too uh, uh, rough around the edges, or they just don't care about the safety of their fellow students. How well, do you look, change if they that? They don't care. They're out. I, like I said, I, I I hope to have a a, a close by school that you know that I don't <laughs> appreciate, and then I refer them to that school. <laughs> no, I wouldn't do that to anyone, but kind of. Um, you know, you you educate, and it and and if they can't figure it out, then you uh, refer out. And like I said, maybe that's to a psychiatrist or maybe a, a football team or something where they can act like that. And it's, it's acceptable behavior. Yeah. Sometimes you it's know? just, but you just, I like to think as a teacher, you like to think that what you teach can help everybody and you can't, you know, like as a, a doctor has a specialty, he knows what he's good at. He should a good doctor, right? Yeah. Plenty of bad doctors out there too. You know, and when he has a client, he's like, you know what? I don't think you're physically wrong at all. I think you need a psychiatrist. He should refer out to whatever, whoever's going to help them. So sometimes I feel like we keep people way too long that we should have just sent on their way. And as teachers, we like to help everybody. And what we have to remember is, is this person giving good experiences or bad experiences to the community? Yeah. You know? That, yeah. And that's, I, I remember my old philosophy with somebody who was uh, too rough on the new people. Uh, it was just to beat them up. <laughs> and that's, that doesn't work. That doesn't work at all because it shows them if you can do it, you do it. And having yeah. a conversation, a lot of times it's that I've experienced, it's somebody who has wrestled and hasn't got the jiu-jitsu culture yet. And they come from a wrestling room where the people in the room with you are also, you know, trying to get a certain spot on the team, you know, trying to get varsity. And, and so they're, they're also competition. It's not really a, a team where you're trying to help everybody out as much as you possibly can. And so just to try to break that mindset from them and say, you know, this is not the wrestling room. This is this is a place where we're training to try to get better. We're not trying to win these rounds. And it, it versus my old way, you know, tap them out as many times as I could in, in a round and, and that doesn't seem to that didn't change anybody. Sure, I think. Then, then what 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 are they gonna do when they're training with the old man for sure? Yeah. Yeah. Are they gonna do the same are they gonna do the same thing just because they can? And then it's interesting with wrestling because, you know, when you put a competitive environment like that and you do have like guys are trying to make the team, like if for me to make varsity wrestling, what am I gonna have to do? Beat the heck out of everybody. And that you've done you came up through that your whole life and that's what you do. And that's why we see so many um, great wrestling programs for old people. Like none, because yeah. they can't laugh. <laughs> just silence. You're like, really? They're I, haven't, no, I they're didn't not. know of any. <laughs> they they tend to do jujitsu, if anything. That's right, because if you didn't make it into college wrestling, you probably just quit. And now you sit on the couch and watch football and drink beer. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to get flack for that. <laughs> no, it's, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a problem with... Um, just our sports education or physical fitness education in general is we, we teach things that, that don't carry on into a, a adulthood or late adulthood. Like there's nobody who's 60 years old, who's playing football. Like that doesn't work. 50 years old. It does like, it, like you're teaching a skill that doesn't, that, that you can't use later in life. And, and the only thing I learned from my sports program in, in, in my school age years was how to, how to run a little bit. And, you know, I'll run around the block if I need to exercise for the day and I haven't been able to get on the mat. So I'll go run a few miles, but that's about it. That's the only actual skill I could, and maybe stretching, which has probably all changed anyways from methods of stretching. But, yeah, uh, you know, the, the wrestling thing, we're not leaving them with a lifelong gift of fitness after you do wrestling. We left them with some good no. experiences, maybe. <laughs> That's the difficult thing about running a school is trying to have, like I said, the environment for both. Yeah. You know, or people to understand both sides. Because there's definitely, like I said, it, you know, jujitsu wouldn't be what it is today if the, you know, if the Gracie family specifically or, the, you know, the Brazilians hadn't taken what was accepted as how 
Japanese jujitsu was and broke the mold by kind of competing and figuring out what works. And the competitive aspect definitely leads the charge for that. So that is also a very important thing. But if you have just that, then uh, you, you, you dismiss or you don't end up giving that service of all that could be all the education and benefit you could get from the art. If you understand both sides, kind of the more gentle side of it as well. Yeah. Uh, man, it's cool to, to talk with you, you know, and you have like elite competitors at, at the same place and you have, uh, just, just people there who, uh, like you say, are the equivalent to, to your dad and want to come in and train and, and enjoy the experience and, and, and do that on the mats. Uh, what are you doing? Now that we, now that we know, now that we know my dad's dead, that sounds weird. <laughs> I'm like, they're not the equivalent to my dad because they're still alive. But yes, 100%. Yeah. Okay. Man. Um, <laughs> So, uh, so what are you doing online with, with, uh, with the website there? Look, it's a funny thing because back in the day, like I said, when I learned triangle, I wasn't allowed to even show anyone else the triangle because I, you know, we're trying to, uh, create a platform to educate schools, how to do it better. So we're trying to create a platform where we teach school owners how to run a school it's going to do a lot of what I've talked about, you know, and it also does, you know, so creating a, a, a good culture that's going to be positive for a wide, you know, for a wide variety of people. Um, but first, it's kind of identifying what's your objective with your school. Like, what are you trying to do? What do you want out of this? And then it's like creating a school built around that, you know, and then included with that is going to, is going to be all the systems, how to, you know, do enrollments, for example, but not in a sleazy way. A lot of what we see in the industry today is just, you know, it's based after like, you know, 24 hour fitness where they're trying to sell you a three year membership and they know that you're going to quit after two months or, you know, trying to maybe shame you into joining the Academy or so it's, it's how to do enrollments in an ethical way, how to do, you know, how's your sales process? How's your funnel? How are you, what kind of, what kind of support are you giving to uh, the back end, like the office, basically how to run a school from nuts to bolts, uh, have it be successful as far as its benefit to the community and to your students. And as far as if you do that well, then it should actually provide you with a living. And where can somebody go to find this? EastonOnline.com. Okay. And, and what else do you have going on? Uh, looks like the podcast is going well. The podcast is going well. You know, the Easton Online podcast is just kind of, you know, uh, interviewing kind of the key players in our, in our uh, school. You know, and that's from admin all the way to the, you know, people teaching on the mat, all the way to the head of the pro team. You know, all that, you know, we also have our pro team where we have a ton of, you know, a bunch of professional fighters um, from Neil Magny, Alistair Overeem, um, lots of different people on that. Um, we got the academies. It's a, it's a wild thing at this point. Like we have a big, um, we have a big system and company that's, you know, much bigger than I am. That's for sure. Yeah. Where, where can somebody go if they want to uh, get a hold of you or ask you a question or keep up with you? Uh, you know, my, my Instagram's kind of all over the place. It's like from family stuff to adventure stuff to jujitsu stuff, but you know, I'm all Easton on Twitter. I'm sorry, not Twitter. Uh, uh, Instagram. That's probably the best place. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's probably the best place. And then, and then, you know, and then through Easton online is a great way. If anybody's interested in any of the, that, that kind of stuff or, cool. you know, come check out the schools or find a good school that suits you well. Go check out a few and see where you feel comfortable. That's awesome. I recommend that for everybody. Jiu-Jitsu is amazing. It's changed my life. I watch it. It's such a positive thing for so many people, um, kids, adults. It's a great thing. And if you go somewhere that you don't feel is right, then, man, find somewhere that's right for you because there's not, not, it's not necessarily one size fits all. And more and more, there's getting to be better and better schools out there. Yeah. They're not all the, the, the garage of the three uh, dishwashers that just beat the crap out of you when you show up. That's right. <laughs> you might That's run right. into I that. I remember when I, opened, when I opened my school, people would criticize. They'd say martial arts should be taught for free in a park. 
<laughs> and I would say, well, that's cool. As long as you know that your martial arts teacher washes dishes to pay his rent. You know, like how much energy does he put into actually your teaching? It was just kind of this feeling like it should be like, you know, I, I came up and got interested in martial arts, partly like with Bruce Lee and Kung Fu. So it was like there was kind of this feeling that it was like this nomadic guy that walked around barefoot. And, you know, it's a different thing. Like if I want my, you know, you know, Dan Gable, who's the best wrestling coach of all time. Yeah, he was on salary from the university and taught to, you know, and and, and was able to pay his bills so he could focus 100 percent on time on how to create the best wrestlers. You know, so people have some weird ideas especially before Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu came about. People had weird ideas about what martial arts was, what it was supposed to do, who should teach it. It's a funny thing. Yeah. But, but you make a good point that you, you you want your instructor to be able to make a uh, a good enough living that they're not going to want to do something else <laughs> and, and that, yeah, that they, they could dedicate their time and energy towards uh, becoming the best that they can. I say if if you help enough people get what they want, then you should get what you want. You yeah. know, and you do. And that's an awesome way to live. It sounds like you, you're very uh, uh, customer oriented with your with your school and your ideas of teaching, and that's just that's great to see. Again, everything's the balance. You know, like it's not all like all of it's not all about the customer, and but mostly, you know, at the same time, like they need to come in here and understand how to act as well. Yeah. You know, like it's not a gym where they pay to come in and do whatever the hell they want. It's a school. It's an academy. People come to learn jujitsu. And with that comes, like, I want them to treat the space with respect. I want, but yeah, 100%. Like, I, I owe a lot to them and I expect a certain amount of return as well. That's awesome. Uh, Amal, I thank you so much for being on here with me today. Any uh, final closing thoughts or things you want to say to the audience? No, that's it. Thank you so much for having me. It's been fun and uh, feel free to reach out. Like I said, my Instagram, I'm all Easton. Be prepared for some random stuff. <laughs> I'm not I'm not super active on it, but probably more than I should be. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Have a great day. It was great to have Amal Easton on the show finally uh, and share some of his jiu-jitsu information and knowledge. I really enjoyed his examples of you know, a, a jiu-jitsu gym could be a farm or a jungle. And in a jungle, it's like the fittest will survive, and it's, you know, uh, survival of the fittest. In a farm, you want to raise up everything. If you're, if you're raising uh, sheep, you want all the sheep to be healthy and to be doing well. You want to take care of, you know, you, the ones who are struggling. You bring them up to speed and, and that sort of thing. Another example he had, uh, are you a swim coach or a lifeguard? They're two different things. Uh, <laughs> they're both very important. So I really enjoyed his examples there uh, as far as... Um, kind of off the mat and, and, and easy to understand. And he brought those in. And out of 323 episodes, I'd never heard either one of those. <laughs> uh, that's pretty impressive. And he just kind of pulled those out of nowhere. So uh, I, I know he has a, a deep, uh, a, a good depth of ability to talk about jiu-jitsu in meaningful ways. So would well, you guys, if you guys are doing jiu-jitsu, would you rather go to the jungle or the farm? Or if, farm. Or, or if you're going to recommend a gym to like, uh, a, a friend, a coworker, or a, uh, you know, a relative, would you send him to the farm or the jungle? The farm. The older you are, the more you like the farm model. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've, I've got, I've, I've got to think that probably the best model, it leans towards the farm, but I don't think that an element of the jungle is necessarily a bad thing. I mean, I think that there's gotta be, I don't know if there's gotta be, but I think it's just human nature that there's a little bit among the young guys of, you know, vying to be the alpha male and <laughs> going back to the quote of the week and Greg Popovich. I, I don't think you need to, I don't think it's healthy to, to sort of program that completely out of everybody. I think there's an element of that that's healthy to keep in. And you, and I think the key is finding balance. But, but if the alpha male can't, role with the new person you need to uh then you don't that have could balance. Be an issue. Yeah, the, yeah, like yeah the, then you then you don't have balance. So that's what I'm saying. You got to you got to let the young guys compete and and sort of thrive and flourish but sort of temper it as well and and they've got it you've got to instill in them the the common sense and and the sense of teamwork so that they understand when the two toughest blue belts are going at it that they go at it. But then when they roll with the new white belt, they uh, dial things back a little bit. So, 
Yeah. You know, and, and Joe, I think that's kind of almost like the competition class. You know, the, the guys like Joe and myself, you know, we love the farm. We love, uh, you know, where everybody's growing and getting nurtured. But I, I like what Joe says. There, there still is that alpha, that desire to be the alpha, to, to impose your will. And, you know, that, that I think a competition class is great for, for that. Uh, I think you can have both of them in your school. Um, but, and it's both aspects are going to, uh, people, some people are going to like the farm. Some people are going to like the jungle. So, uh, um, I don't know what I'm trying to say, but, uh, I'm a, I'm a farmer. Yeah. Gary, Gary, you're, you're on the right line. I think we, we always talk about, uh, leaving your ego at the door and that's a simple way to say it, but I don't think that's correct because we all have an ego. It's, it's we, we do. We are. It's yeah. about having a healthy ego Good point. and a hel- And if I have a healthy ego, I don't have to prove to the new white belt that I'm better than him. And and if he outpoints me in a training round and goes off the mat and I overhear him telling somebody, I don't have to go up and set the record straight either. If my if my ego is healthy, it doesn't matter to me. I had a good role, he had a good role, and given enough time, he's gonna learn and he's not gonna continue to go out and talk about how he tapped a purple belt. But a, a healthy ego means I don't have to crush people. I like that, Joe. And the reality is I can't anyway. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, there is there is room. If you go to a training room and it's got a bunch of elite athletes, that may be more of a jungle feel, but it's still not survival of the fittest. It's not one person tearing down everybody else around them. It's still uh, – it's, maybe it's more fierce or a little more active, and, and, and new people would not fare well there to learn. But it's – a good team is full of people who are helping the other aspects of the team. Yes. If, you, if you go to uh, Amal Easton's class, his best, best athletes are not trying to compete for the number one spot at the gym. They're trying to, to get to be better, you know, themselves, of course, but they also want their teammates to get better. And that's why, you know, you got, he's got the, guys in the UFC or ADCC, like the, the, the better your team, the better you. It's not a secret. So uh, I think we're all here on the farm, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which is good because we live in Kansas and Texas, <laughs> and that's more farm area than jungle area. <laughs> Gary, you left the barn door open. <laughs> uh, Joe found us a fun article. What'd you find? Well, actually, you kind of got us thinking down this road. We did an article on how to get better at soccer. We did an article on how to get better at skateboarding. And it occurred to me while I was thinking about that and thinking maybe I'd help Byron out and find an article that jujitsu is often compared to chess. And I'll be honest, I haven't thought too deeply into that. And I've always kind of accepted that, well, you compare chess to checkers and um, you have to think more moves ahead in chess and you have more weapons available and you have to consider those and it's always been kind of that simple to me Uh, but i found this article how to win at chess and they've got six bullet points which is awesome it makes for an easy discussion here and they have a couple of article or a couple of points that i hadn't really thought about too much but each of these points i see a direct correlation to jujitsu the first one is make good opening moves and we think in a competition sense that you want to go out and you want to get a takedown maybe that's your your game plan for the match and you think of that takedown as the opening move but i don't think so because in chess you know you're moving your pawns out you're kind of setting pieces in place before you make the attack and i i think that uh maybe we overlook now the people that compete probably don't overlook this as much as guys like me do but how important it is that first grip you get um st- uh, determining the stance that's going to be taken. I might come out and I might want my right foot forward and I want my might want my opponent's right foot forward and he comes out left foot forward. So I've got to figure out a way to either change my game plan or get him to change his stance. And the opening moves to get all that set up are so crucial. Um, so that's a great one. Gary, do you have a chance to look at any of these points and see how they relate? You know, uh, yeah, definitely. I like uh, point number three get your pieces in position and i think it kind of goes back to like you were saying get op- good opening moves um, you know get your pieces in position it, it, i think of uh you know position before submission you know the thing we've always heard you know uh, i i sure as heck can't submit you if i'm not 
in the position I need to be. And, you know, for somebody that may me be mean pulling half guard, that may mean, uh, you know, getting the takedown and being on top. But um, I'm not going to be able to, you know, go down the path to get my my submission, my bring my A game if I'm not where I need to be. Um, so I want to make sure I'm in the, the perfect position to get that submission. Um, so I really yeah, like Gary, that one. Gary, you ever seen somebody like try and do a scissor sweep and they just don't have the right grips? They, they've got nothing set up. They just go over just, on their side and try to sweep. Yeah, and, yeah. And what ends up happening? They get the guard passed. Yeah, I mean, you gotta you gotta have those grips in position and stuff. You gotta have so. those grips. You gotta have their posture broken down. You gotta have them, you know, elongated. It's just gonna make that that sweep much easier. Yep, perfect. Yeah, and uh, I'm going to combine number four and number five for the tips if somebody else takes number six because number six is also very important. (laughs) (laughs) But uh, uh, number four is coordinate an attack on the king, which is in chess the way you win. You put them in checkmate. You put the king to where um, uh, they can't – they're defenseless and also stuck. And then uh, number five would be watch the safety of your own king. So while you're making an attack – don't get so distracted by the offense. But the attack needs to be like a plan. One one piece is not likely to be able to checkmate the king. You're going to need to maneuver several pieces. You're going to need, need to be able to pass the guard. You need, need to be able to get to the person's back. You need to be able to win the hand fight and to get to the neck. And you know, like one thing does not necessarily get you a submission. And in this process, if you're trying to pass the guard and you're so you're wrapped up in that, you get caught in a in a gi choke and you forget, oh yeah, he's also attacking me at the same time. Uh, you know, watch the safety of your own king. And I think this is this is a pretty good one because that's one of my my problems. I I I don't get attacked. I don't get tapped out a lot from the guard. You know, usually I'm if I get tapped out, it's from a position of side control or mount or back. It's one of those things, but. If I get tapped from the guard, usually I'm too focused on trying to pass, and I'm not really worried about my own defense but while I pass. And that just reminds me of watch the safety of your own king. I need to watch my own neck sometimes. Yeah, that, that's a great point. Well, one of my earliest memories in jiu-jitsu, and I still remember it so clearly, uh, about 15 years ago, I was 37, just started training, and I've probably been training a month or three, something like that, and we did uh, King of the Hill, King of the Mat takedown type drills quite frequently. And, um, and most of the class, of course, was 22, 25. So even though 37 now, I don't think is old at all. I felt kind of old at the time. <laughs> but I felt like I kept up with the guys all right. And so we're doing these takedown drills. And I just throw caution to the wind and, and just shoot in for a blast double leg or something. And I remember that time slowed down enough that – while I'm pulling this guy's feet up from anything, I'm thinking, I'm going to take this guy down. I, I'm going to win this round. And and it, things sort of slowed down and then sped up very quickly because I couldn't tap fast enough because that guillotine was <laughs> locked in so tight before we ever hit the ground. You know, and It's just a perfect example. I was brand new. I didn't really understand all the counters to things that I might do. And, man, I thought I had that double leg and – uh, the tables turned very quickly because I wasn't watching out for my own safety. That's funny that you said that because when Byron was saying he was going to combine four and five and, you know, was coordinate attack on the king and watch your safety, your own king. The first thing I was thinking about is somebody uh, going in for a takedown, you know, to to attack the king, but leaves his neck hanging out there. And then uh, you bring up that example. So awesome, Joe. Hey, uh, let's always talk about uh, number six, uh, always be a good sport. And, you know, we're always going to lose. And really, is it losing? I, I don't even like to call it losing. I like to call it learning. And uh, I like his very last line. Uh, so be gracious and kind when it's over. And then here's the key part. And then take the time to think about what you could do better next time. You know, jujitsu and chess, it's a learning, you know, game. We're, we're always learning. If we're not learning, we're if we're not learning and we're not in pain in jujitsu, we're probably passed away and we don't want that. But <laughs> so, um, you know, always, you know, I'm always thinking about after I after a practice, you know, what I could have done better, what mistakes I made. Um, and 
I think that's why I like jujitsu so much. It's, it's, it's like tinkering on a car. You're always trying to get more horsepower out of your engine. You know, I'm always tinkering, you know, Hey, how can I get better? How am I going to, you know, attack that leg better? How am I going to escape this position better? And, uh, that's, it's so fun because the game is never over. I'm always trying to learn new things. Yeah. And I think sort of the next level on this one, um, when, when guys get caught with something unexpected, a wrist lock or, or, or an arm bar from an unusual position, uh, I see you guys react two different ways. I see guys and not necessarily in a bad sport kind of way, but they're like, damn it, I can't believe I got caught with that. You know, that was just crazy. And then I see other guys, are they get excited. They're like, holy crap, I can't believe I got submitted from that position. And how, how did you set that up? And how did you get that grip? And, and, and they – they get excited about this opportunity to learn something different. And I think when you finally get your mindset to that, your, your learning curve will just, it'll be off the charts, I think. Yeah, that's a, that's a good way to, to approach jujitsu and it, approach anything. Yeah. If, if something surprises you or you, you have an opportunity to learn, you could, I can be upset. Gary tapped me with a variation of leg lock I've never seen. Or I could say, what was that? <laughs> like, yeah, exactly. I want to learn that because it's available for me to learn now. If Gary didn't even know that, if I never got tapped with that, I wouldn't, there, I, there's no opportunity there for learning. So yeah, fun article. And let's, uh, let's try to keep this trend up of, uh, we'll see if we remember, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> next let's, week, let's challenge we're Gary. Talk, yeah. Next week we're going to talk about how to ride a giraffe. Okay. Gary, you, you're an article man. And if, if you find a giraffe writing article, email it to me and we'll have it ready to go or any sort of a strange animal writing. Cause I, I think, yeah, I would might take be any zoo much. animal. Yeah. Without and also I don't want to get in trouble. Said. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> no, that's what, that's what Joe said. That's what Joe said. She did not say that. Joe said that. <laughs> uh, we reached a new low today. <laughs> uh, I have. <laughs> Was it? Hey, we're all in the same boat, man. Yep. Yep. It's not about I, Joe. It's about the team. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Oh, this team. <laughs> we do have a team that supports us, and they're on Patreon. And uh, just to highlight a couple of our team members that have been uh, long-supporting uh, Patreon supporters, uh, Allison, Gerald, and Steven, thank you guys for your continued support on Patreon. Uh, we have no new Patreon supporters this week, uh, hoping we'll get a couple. But really, we have a good team. Uh, always looking to, to grow that a little bit. But uh, what happens when you support us on Patreon is you pit, you pledge like a dollar or two uh, per episode, and that money goes and supports the show. And we, we did the, the bonus episodes with ADCC, didn't put those through the Patreon process. So those are bonus to everybody. But uh, I'll mail you out a 5-inch BJ Day Brick Gee Patch. Make that two gee patches. You, you you still while I've got a few left can get the uh, the legacy gee patch, which is just it's old school. It's just me and Gary, and then you have the two point uh, updated version with Joe on there. It looks amazing. It's got a lot more stitching and details to it, and uh, also send you out a sticker. So when you sign up on Patreon, put in your address, and that's where I'll send you that anywhere in the world. I still get emails from people. I can't believe you sent it way out here. Yeah, there's an international stamp the other thing on there. The whole thing fits in an envelope. It's uh, pretty easy. I'm not ma- mailing out geese here, which would cost, I don't know, 30 bucks a ship around the world. Uh, gee patches go pretty easy throughout the mail. And you also could join a private Facebook group. So add me as a friend on Facebook, and then I could add you through the group. My name is Byron Jabara. I'm the only one on Facebook, and uh, it should be pretty easy to find Joe and Gary from there if you want to add them. But uh, yeah, Patreon has been fun, and the private Facebook group is a good way to talk trash on Gary, and occasionally <laughs> Joe. I'm sure, I'm sure we'll have something about the zoo animals on Joe coming up very shortly. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> I'll take any uh, zoo animal. <laughs> oh man! <laughs> well, you know, I, when you when you spend half your life on a ship, you get a little less. Oh <laughs> 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 my god! Uh, yeah, check out the new shop. Hopefully, it works out good, and we're able to still sell a few books. Uh, it, hopefully, the the they're not too hidden. I don't know how much the images in the uh, show notes helped, but uh, if not, if you want to if you want to check out the just the books, there's links in the show notes still to everything. Uh, go follow Amal Easton or train with him if you get a chance. 
Uh, not sure about next week, so we have a couple possibilities. I have an interview that that uh, I'm going to be I'm going to be recording tomorrow, and I want to get that out as soon as possible. So if that happens, we'll, we'll air an interview, even though it's the last episode of the week. If we do that, or last episode of the year, or, no, man, I have trouble. Last episode <laughs> of the month, <laughs> week to year to month. Uh, usually, last episode of the month we do a topic episode, and so we might do that for the first episode of next month just because we, we do enjoy doing the topic episodes and I know that they're always a hit with the listeners so uh, we'll see how that goes with the interview that I have scheduled for tomorrow I don't uh, I, so I've learned in podcasting I don't like talk about the interviews I haven't recorded yet because sometimes they just don't happen or you know they get delayed a week or two and then I promise something I can't deliver so I do want to deliver what I what I say I can so that's what she said <laughs> Byron's always but, promising something he can't deliver. <laughs> we at the zoo anyway. <laughs> but uh, I, I had fun with you guys this week. Uh, good, good show and stay sweaty, my friends. And don't forget to run a sub four minute mile. Train hard, train smart, train with zoo animals and get better. Thank you for listening. I hope you find the time today to roll. After all. The best way to get better at Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is to do Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. No, but if you had to, if you had to grapple a zoo animal that was over a hundred pounds, what would it be? Sloth. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Sloths have claws. I might go with a panda bear. Oh, a panda? Are you crazy? Those things are mean and tough. <laughs> are they? Yes. Oh, never mind. Uh, yeah, I, I, we got a tortoise here that he could take. Oh, good, good one there. <laughs> well, I, I don't know. You, you, you never get to its dr- neck. Yeah, it'd be a draw at best. Yeah, I'll take a draw when you get fighting an animal with hundred pounds. <laughs> <laughs>